Hello, everyone. Welcome to Latitudes in Art. Following the presentation, uh, there'll be a small reception over in the Purple Chimney Cafe. I hope everybody can attend. I'm Barbara Sexton, the interim curator of the Mesa College Art Gallery. On behalf of the Art Department and Mesa College, I'd like to introduce Liza Liu this evening. Liza creates incredible beaded installations about everyday life. Last January, after five years of work, her kitchen installation premiered at the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York City and was applauded by the public and the, and the critics. Not an easy achievement. Now Liza is creating a beaded backyard scheduled to open in Santa Monica Museum next year. Please welcome me to our program, Liza Liu, the Bead Lady. So at some point, some kind of drama is going to happen and lights are going to dim, right? Doo -doo -doo. Maybe not. Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> um, I'm going to show slides of my work. Oh, see? Huh? Um, basically, I don't know. Um, I hate the bead lady thing, but um, it's just the price I pay for the kind of work that I do, which is um, dealing with these little um, materials. And what I'd like to do is... Um, assume that you don't know anything about my work or where it comes from and I want to show you um, how I started okay so here we go da -da -da -da. now I just okay <laughs> this is um, the first thing I ever beaded um, and I thought it was really important to show it to you because um, I started as a, as a painting major in college um, and I always made paintings and sculptures and studied painting formally. And I started to use beads, I guess it was in 1989. And um, I was really criticized for it. And um, for some reason, that criticism really inspired me. <laughs> and the thing was, was that this was one of the first things I ever beaded. I don't know if it's the very first thing. This is the first thing I ever did that was completely enshrined in beads. And um, it's really badly done. And I want to just kind of have us all meditate on how poor this is and the fact that um, <laughs> I mean, there's people that are here that work with me on a daily basis, and Noriko's somewhere here, and she is probably cringing at this, really. It's horrible. But I, it was the first time I'd ever beaded anything, and I was a painter, and my hands were very clumsy with small material. I always made huge sort of sweeping motions when I made things, and I was always this great um, mess. But the fact that I was criticized for using beads inspired me, and the fact that this seemed to be a, a metaphor for maybe um, the female experience, um, and also about everyday product, sort of enshrining it and making it sort of that thing about satisfaction guaranteed. When you put beads on things, suddenly they, they look precious. So anyway, I was willing to endure um, what it took to sort of improve at what it was, was te about the technique of what it is to use beads. So here's another one. I, I mean, I was really sort of insistent on becoming, you know, training my hands, learning how to use the material. Here's my second soup can. Um, I did a lot more. <laughs> the whole point was that I wanted to improve. The, the, the I realized that, um, I, I know that as an artist, um, the craft of what you do isn't who you are. I mean, you, you know, you're trying to use, you're trying to, as an artist, you're trying to say something. But let's face it, I mean, who's using beads? You can't really go to, to art school and learn, you know, bead 101. So I had to put in the time to train my hands. And I, apparently, I was willing to do that and endure, like, all the ridicule, which was, which was pretty intense, you know, suddenly I wasn't considered an artist anymore by any friends or anyone who I knew in school, so I ended up leaving the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and I just began to bead everything I knew, and as a student I really always ate macaroni and cheese, so I did a few of these. I didn't show you the first, this is actually the second one I did, the first one I did was even worse, but this is pretty horrible too. And the reason I say it's horrible is, is, is that it's not, um, it's just obvious how clumsy it is. Like you can see in the corner on the left, it's just kind of like crooked and weird. Um, now it's harder for me to, to, to make things crooked and weird, which in a way is unfortunate. Um, this is a Trix cereal box, and I sculpted this out of this heavy, heavy clay. I don't know. And it's just all about sort of learning the material. And also about wanting to, um, when I started doing these things immediately, I wanted to use, um, deal with everyday life, you know, the commonplace world. And I wanted to do um, mass-produced 
objects. To me, that seemed really fitting, and um, everything I looked at seemed to need a bead, basically. And so I did every single cereal box in the grocery aisle. Slow down. Okay, well, I have a lot of slides, you guys, and you're going to get so, if I don't, so, somewhere there's got to be a limit. So now, okay, I'm getting better. This is 19, by now I've been using beads for um, like four years. I mean, this is like a process of, and I, apparently it must not have gotten terribly tired of food. I don't know. Um, but then, you know, those wonderful, um, those wonderful things you get in the newspaper on Sunday, it has all those magazine, it shows all the products. I, I just find that so inspiring. It's so awful and inspiring. It's all like laid out. So here they are all laid out in beads. And this was a turning point. The biggest piece that you see, that Omo box, um, I saw that and I don't know, I just stood back. It was the middle of the night and I was looking at all my stuff and I, I realized, first of all, that I needed to bead the world. And I mean, it was just completely necessary that everything be beaded because I, I really think that this is um, beautiful. And I really think that beyond the fact that I'm using beads, it's a metaphor for something else. And all the labor that it takes to do it, you know, you're doing something and you, I don't know if this ever happens to you, but you ever do things and just wonder, you know, why am I doing this? And, and I don't know, I guess I felt like I had to justify it somehow and say, well, okay, well then I'm going to be the world because then that'll make sense somehow if I take this all the way. Because I was still being really made fun of. I was sort of like this complete craft bead chick. And, and so I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to really show you. I'm going to be the world. And not only that, but I'm going to be the kitchen. So immediately I saw that all of those products, all of those objects were part of a grander scheme. And this was only the beginning. So I got into candy and I really did admit I gained a lot of weight during this period because I was doing research and development. Um, and I got into, um, this was kind of an interesting thing. I really, you know, I see the work, it has to be installation because when you're dealing with something, a humble object, you're, you're dealing with a humble material like beads you're instantly not sort of taken seriously. You're just like this craft freako. So um, to me, it has to be multiplied a lot of times in order to make a point. And this piece, popcorn, was like 100 pieces of popcorn individually sculpted and then uh, you know, painted, and then the beads are applied. And um, it, I, it's really important to me that everything that I make stands on its own as sculpture. Not only is it important to me as an artist, because I think that's what makes um, a work of art really work, but um, it's important if you want to make a living and, um, and, and have the objects go to people's homes, um, which was how I was surviving. And this was a piece that I did for someone that I'll never see again, um, who's in like Hollywood somewhere in the movie industry. And um, so a lot of the, the cereal boxes and the things that I showed you, I knew I was doing a kitchen, but I had to sell a lot of them to keep going, which is a whole other story, which we'll get into later. So here's another product from out of the kitchen, Ruffles potato chips. Ruffles have ridges. And I just really, to me, it's this whole metaphor about daily life. And this is probably sick and twisted, but you know on television, those commercials where we focus in on, on the quicker picker-upper and, and toilet paper and sponges and how important it is to have that sponge. In a way, that's really this perversion of Zen that you're focusing in on everyday life in this really strange way. But um, so I'm doing that because the process of doing this work is so um, quiet. It's so meditative. It's, and I'm working on a ruffles, this kind of perversion of what the potato is. But it's this process of bead by bead with the tweezers. Um, so it's a kind of, to me, it's an interesting irony. But I really got into a lot of um, snack foods and beverages. And, you know, this piece, I did this in 1992. Um, and it was meant to be a part of the kitchen. And um, I, I saw a dark hour during the making of trying to do this kitchen, you know, all these objects and products. Well, in order to keep going, to keep buying beads, I ended up selling this particular piece. And, um, and, and I really regret doing that because I had no other way to get, keep going if I didn't sell it. I had somebody came in my studio, they said, you know, I really want to have this piece. But um, the fact is, is that someone now owns a piece of the kitchen, which is, we'll get into later. Um, Perrier. Here's a toaster. That toaster, um, the cord is all woven um, bead by bead. I did a lot of that on the airplanes and, you know, it took the place of reading. So at a certain moment I discovered books on tape. So here is a lot of that put together. Um, 
you see the salt and pepper, you see the cereal boxes on the, in the left a little bit, um, the cup and saucer, and um, it's kind of starting to become a, a beaded universe. This is not to say that I was being taken seriously at this moment, but at least um, it seemed as though, to me, this evoked a whole world, or it was beginning to. This is a, um, this is um, in LA, this is my studio in LA, and this was how far along I was in all those objects making. You can see that I had started on the stove, um, the refrigerator's there in the background, and um, right, at, right at this moment, um, I was really struggling financially, and, you know, as I was always struggling, but still am. But anyway, um, here's the stove, close up of the stove, and there's Barbie dolls happening. There's another one of the stove. So I was kind of trying to juggle all these things at the same time in order to support the making of this project. You know, like selling bits is like making a painting and then snipping off little pieces of it in order to support, to be able to continue. But in the meantime, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happening just in terms of the piece. I got really interested in Emily Dickinson around this time. I was spending so much time alone where days on end I didn't walk outside. Um, I just was sort of devoting every day that I had in my studio, and it's still this way, but maybe it felt more intense um, when I was working on this piece. Every day that I had that I could just devote myself to my work, I just 100% did that and didn't want to even leave for a second because it was such a privilege to have that moment. Okay, I don't have to do something else. I don't have to take a day job today. I don't have to um, make a commission. Here's my moment in time to do this. And it became really where I didn't see people. And I was so alone and I got really interested in Emily Dickinson. So the side of the stove um, has this poem that Emily Dickinson wrote about um, women's work. It says, she rose to his requirement, dropped the playthings of her life to take the honorable work of woman and of wife. So the side of that is sort of like this quilt. And the small print underneath the stove says, it is like the small print. If aught she missed in her new day of amplitude or awe or first perspective or the gold in using wore away, it lay unmentioned as the sea develops pearl and weed but only to himself is known the fathoms they abide. And so to me, that was like this really sort of ironic poem about, um, on the one hand, she's dropping everything that she is, and, and it's supposed to be so great, and yet everything that she is, the only person who knows how brilliant this woman is, you know, sort of archetypal 19th century housewife, homemaker, would be the husband. So there was a sort of like, all this greatness and all of her magnitude was set into her, into her spouse. And to me, that's tremendously sort of sad. And, and, and on another level, it's ironic that Emily Dickinson would write this poem since um, she spent her life alone. And I just sort of um, resonate with her, the way that she, she wrote her letter to the world, in a sense, from her own yard, from her own home. And it ended up sort of um, translating to a lot of people. And that's really what artists do, is that you're spending all this time alone. But in a way, you're, you're communicating with, with a lot of people when you do that. Hopefully you do. Hopefully, ultimately, you communicate. But at the time, at this particular moment, um, making the stove, I really didn't know whether or not I was communicating with anyone or, or really what was going to be the fate. It just seemed really hard. And also, obviously, when you're working on a kitchen, you can't escape the fact that it's about women and women's work and women's labor. So um, the, the stove rack is a woven cord. And I got it. OK, so that, that was the whole leading up to this whole thing was that I really became so broke. And I had to do a commission, and this was a huge commission. This is the commission, this woman met me, I was photographing my work in a gallery, and she happened to see me at the gallery and said, you know, would you do a vanity for me? It would be so precious. And so I said, well, okay, but I'll do it only if I can do portraits of you in your life, because I, I originally thought that the kitchen was going to have um, beaded portraits of, 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 of women all on the ceiling, but I ended up not doing that. But at any rate, this I wanted to use it as an exercise in portraits using beads, so I chose to do her life. Um, all the windows represent different things, uh, rather the drawers are different things, and the side there I ended up making, I made it this whole homage to her life, and um, she wasn't expecting that, I think she just wanted a really spangly, groovy thing, but you know, when you're doing that for someone, you're taking away from your own work, I at least wanted it to have value for me as an artist. Um, so here's uh, portraits of mom and dad, and I tried to choose pick images that were really classic, you know, so that it, would, it wouldn't just be homage to Francie but that it would be, you know, everyone has a mom and dad. So anyway. And these are classic sort of 50s trout fishing with dad and sis. And these are like teeny little um, beads the size of, um, I don't know, dust flivel. 
Um, there's Francie as a, as a youngster in the lower right, and then there she is like in her 60s hippie days. Um, there she is as a little, little nipper, a little close up. But the cool thing about this was that, okay, so I was living in LA and it bought me all this time ahead in my studio. So I, I like gave a whole bunch, I took all the money that I made and I just gave it to my landlord like here. And then the earthquake hit. And um, so I had to evacuate my studio in LA and um, I was right at this point here where you see pretty much about this much stuff and I had to evacuate everything in like two hours we had um, to just move everything out. None of my work got destroyed, but I had to leave a lot of lumber and stuff behind. So that's what brought me to San Diego. Hello, there I am. Um, and this particular image was also sort of like this turning point. It was this big turning point to um, realize that you no longer have a home and you just, you know, you've lost your studio, um, this harrowing kind of moment. And, and all this time making the kitchen, I never knew whether or not I was gonna show it anywhere, whether or not I was gonna have support. But this particular image um, became a postcard for a show I did. Um, it was in progress at um, Cal State Fullerton. And um, Marsha Tucker, the director of the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York City, saw the postcard and called me like the next day and, from her home and said, you know, I'm taking the kitchen, you know, we're, we're gonna bring it here. So um, that was like, ah, you know, <laughs> the angels rejoiced. Uh, and then I was allowed to continue in a sense. Not that I had any, any financial thing, but there's this whole chutzpah that you get when you realize that, that you're actually gonna, somebody might even see your work. It was this wonderful sort of jolt. So it was this strange moment where I had lost something, but, but it was, the project was gonna move forward. There it is, finished. <laughs> the interesting thing was that for the longest time, um, the last thing, you know, I'm going to kind of, I emphasize that this whole process, it was sort of like um, a lot of, a lot of sort of mixed things happening because um, doing something of this magnitude requires your entire life. I mean, it really, it really was sort of like this daily journey of um, surviving. How do you, how do you make a massive work of art? How do you make uh, something that's almost 200 square feet and you don't have any money, you don't have any grants and you, how do you do that? <laughs> um, one beat at a time, I guess. And you just don't quit. But here it is, the finished project. And it's really fun to talk about it in the past tense. Um, the, the, the wonderful thing that happened to me, in addition to, um, you know, like the big break that you get, Marsha Tucker um, saying, okay, there's going to be a show. The, the second wonderful thing that happened, probably more important to me than, than the show was, was that I was able to get an intern who started working with me during the fast, the last four months of my um, working on this piece, and she's, and her name is Noriko, and she's here tonight, and she's worked with me, um, worked with me on doing the tiles and helping me to finish this project. So that was like this really amazing saving grace was to have this um, sweet human um, there with me, and so it wasn't totally lonely and horrible. I just want you to know that. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people always look at this and they think that I must be the biggest bead martyr, but actually it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of joy. Um, so this is all those objects put together from all those years. You know, like you, now you see the Frosted Flakes and the Cap'n Crunch, but m much of w which um, is in private collections. So what I'm going to have to do now is probably recreate them because a lot of the people who bought them are just these bored housewives, actually, um, in Beverly Hills who, who don't really want to share the pieces. So I'm probably going to have to make them again, because now the kitchen, it opened at the New Museum in New York, and then it went on to the Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and next it's going to the Baltimore Museum, so it's just like endlessly kind of been getting this play, getting this airtime, and um, all of these collectors from Beverly Hills have been calling me saying, when am I going to get my beer back for my counter at home to the acclaim of my husband Leonard? It was horrible. It's just so horrible. I, I, I wish that I had just done a day job because, um, you know, and I keep thinking of how I'm going to get my revenge on these people and there's no way they own, you know, there's, I can't get any revenge. They bought these things for like a hundred dollars. I mean, uh, I, I, I keep thinking I'll get them back, but you can't get them back. You can't. What do you do? I just get to tell you guys and <laughs> name names. So um, here's the stove. and. This is, you know, it's kind of fun for me to see that all of it sort of put together because I was showing you these slides when it was sort of in the beginning period and 
it was sort of about a lot of sort of ironic images. You know, I mean, Emily Dickinson is on the side of that stove, and then there's um, Barbie. It just seemed important to me to have a reference to Barb. Here's a close-up of the stove. This is really kind of a, a neat thing. You can, you can really see the, the fact that it's um, bead by bead. Um, but it's kind of anthropomorphic. Do you see how there's like the two eyes and the weird little mouth, the blue, the big wide, wow. Inside of the stove is beaded with the gals from the truck, you know, the mud flaps. I really, you know, what is with that? I just... So, you know, here they are. I mean, there has to be a reference to, uh, since this is a kitchen, you know, it's funny because in the making of the kitchen, um, I've been, I was so criticized in the sense, you know, curators told me, you know, you'd better, you'd better stop because, you know, this is, are you talking about feminism? You know, like, uh-oh. And, you know, you're going to get so hated that, um, you know, you might as well quit. You might as well do, my next project is going to be a backyard. And I knew that, you know, right when, when I was doing the kitchen, like right in the middle of the kitchen, I was thinking I've got to do a backyard next. And this particular curator said to me, you know, I'm more interested in your next project because it doesn't deal with feminism. Like, you know, that's horrible. And, and it really, you know, I'm just beating a kitchen. It's not really like I'm, there's no blood, there's no urine, there's no reference really in a hardcore way to, to women's issues except that it's a kitchen it's a place where women have been and like it was problematic like uh-oh let's just do a garage instead so anyway it was just this really weird thing where i was already like fully you know completely and totally immersed in this project and this curator was telling me you know you might as well you know, I feel really sorry for you, Liza. This is really too bad, but I think this is what's going to happen to you. And I just said, well, you know, I don't know what I'll do. Let's do what you want me to do. And um, his face turned really red. But anyway, that, th this is like the only time I really kind of get involved. And this isn't even really, I don't think this is even, I'm not putting anything there that's not under there. And here's the inside of a stove, and it has to be kind of hot and steamy anyway. So here's a bunch of nude babes. Hope you don't have a problem with that. <laughs> And here's the water. I mean, I don't see really hardcore feminism in this, do you? But um, here's the water, and the um, you know, sort of like eternally pouring out. And um, I really got involved in the, the swirl of the water. I wanted it to kind of, you know, who knows what's in the water these days? So there's these kind of patterns and funky, strange, unusual beads going on. And there's the Comet and Joy, which, oh, those are in collections. Um, but you can kind of see the patterns. You can kind of see the movement. These are like eternally, you know. I mean, if women have been doing dishes for like a zillion years, I want them to be permanently cleaned. I want there to be a place where that room is so damn clean. Because women have been cleaning and mopping and scrubbing and ironing and mending to no acclaim. Well, now there's a beaded shrine to that labor. And the actual labor of applying beads is um, a metaphor for all that labor. It's a metaphor for the labor of not just um, not just women's work, but but labor at large, any kind of labor, um, janitorial labor, any kind of labor that perishes or that's unsung, and the doing of this work is very much um, about a joy, and um, it's a celebration. Just even the doing, it's a privilege um, to be able to to do this. It's a miracle to be able to do this. Um, to be able to 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 spend my life doing this kind of work, even though at times it's 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 a challenge. Um, here's the um, the blender with the glittering batter dripping from it, and the cookbook, and this is how to bake a cherry pie, which I think is really kind of steamy. You know, it's like really um, combined. I mean, it's just sort of funny to me. I wanted to bead the whole book. I mean, there's something about the cookbook. Somebody actually gave me this cookbook as a gift. It, you know, like really gave me a real like new cookbook and I just thought what am I going to do with this cookbook so I covered it in paper mache and put beads on it and it seems to work so I don't know how to bake a pie or any of that stuff but the, you know I want to sort of permanently make it a testament to the people who do um, there's the toaster which I showed you a long time ago but I included this this slide again because I wanted to to show you the difference of what happens when you take the object uh, away you know, you take the object and you put it into the environment, how much more this has, how much more um, the meaning, how it's, it multiplies itself. The really sad thing about the work I do is that it requires that I do this in order to make the point I'm making. It wasn't enough just to have the toaster. I had to put it on the counter. And then the importance of when I showed you those early slides about just trying to get my hands trained to do this work, 
Um, well, you can see now why that was so important, because every inch, it's no longer about just like, oh, gee, I guess I'll just stick a bead here. It's really, it, everything's deliberate. And that's really, really important as an artist or just, you know, to, to first master the material so that it becomes second nature. And to me, the beads aren't beads, they're just they're three-dimensional paint. You can see in the left, this is still in progress. I was kind of like painting the underside of the wall. You know, that count, that's a, um, a shelf above. Oops, I guess I just did something weird. Focused it. And there's the dust balls. And, <laughs> you know, my studio is like really dirty. And But all the dirt is like beads all over the floor. So this seemed perfect to actually sculpt little dust wads and bead them. It seems appropriate to me. Um, so after this project, um, I had another kind of um, drastic turning point. Actually, during this project, this, the next couple slides I'm going to show you um, are about this little problem I had. Oh, no, maybe not. OK, well, this is a little problem. This is the making of the, the thing. Alone. <laughs> Making, setting out the floor tiles. Someone who needs a manicure. Um, gosh, doesn't my studio look clean, you guys? There's people who are in my studio on a daily basis here, and they're probably blown away. Okay, this is <laughs> this is about the end of a relationship. Um, at the end of a of an eight year relationship, um, this person in my life um, had all these dirty socks that he left behind, and he wouldn't come get them. And so I beaded them. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> I did this project. Um, this particular sh slide is like during the kitchen, the making of the kitchen, I guess. Um, I had to deal, you know, like, how do you deal with intense grief? I don't know. I mean, like, what do you do with all the, you know, the artwork, the detritus of, uh, of a broken heart? How do you deal with all that stuff that's left behind? You know, the pictures, the um, dirty underwear, the socks, all that stuff that's left behind is sort of like this great wad, like this great ulcer, um, this three-dimensional ulcer. And so I kind of just wanted to make it pretty. There's one of his socks. <laughs> Did I tell you he had a lot of socks? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it did make me feel a lot better. And there's the underwear. I thought that, that, you know, the whole thing about going through something painful is that, you know, we try to cover it up. It's like the whole, the whole corny thing about skeletons in your closet or dirty laundry. Well, this isn't dirty, it's pretty. There's a pair of his trousers. But those are, those are actually um, paper mache. I mean, at a certain moment, I mean, enough is enough. Okay, it's not all about you, buddy. But it kind of was. I mean, you know, it's like about loss and about things left behind. Um, nylons. <laughs> um, but the cool thing about this show was that it was all, um, I did the show at Franklin Furnace in New York, and um, I had it all kind of on the floor, so you had to walk around. You had to sort of like walk along the walls. And this, this um, person walked in the, the, the gallery, and she's like, this is just like home. So. And it was really great because it was just like home at home and I'd have stuff laying around, it was just an installation. Well, this is, you know, never one to just, you know, I'm always one to like beat a dead horse. But here I am doing it again. This is a, a, a sort of an advanced version of the show. I did this recently at um, Haynes Gallery in San Francisco. This is called Most Admired Disorder. And I wanted to take it a little bit further. So there's a pair of shoes hanging sort of suspended about like four inches off the floor. And it's about disarray. And um, some of the socks and things, but there's the chair that's leaning on the side. And um, to me, it's, it's sort of um, the challenge of using the materials that I use are that, um, you know, it's a craft material. And I'm always saying that these are pain. I'm always sort of defending my point. But in order to make my point, I have to take it so far. Um, I have to take it all the way. I, ca I can't just get away with making one sock. I have to make like a hundred socks and then and then maybe I'm given the credit that I'm being deliberate as an artist to use these materials, which shocks me because, um, you know, I think that most of our culture is mired in the 19th century. People still think that paint and marble, those are art materials. Well, the fact is people are making things out of spitballs and um, hair wads. So I don't think I'm that, I don't think that, you know, I'm always surprised that I'm asked always to be in these bead shows because I'm, I'm, I'm using beads as a, a metaphor for something else. I'm a painter. 
and an installation art. So, you know, it's, it seems dull to have to talk about that, doesn't it? But there we are, um, the chair. This is really, um, it's sort of like, I feel like I'm showing these slides, like how to get carpal tunnel. <laughs> um, there's the shoe with the, um, the beaded shoelace. Um, and those, those are really funny little shoelaces. They're all wired. And you can't really tell it's suspended, but it's suspended over that little um, lingerie piece. And there's a, there was a lamp with a woven cord and a hanging shoe. So I guess I just wanted to just show these slides and endlessly. Um, <laughs> the shoe. <laughs> Which leads us to men. I mean, I got into like male culture when I was doing that shoe. And um, so this was really right after the kitchen. I, I'm always saying about the thing about beads being paint. Well, I wanted to do a show that really showed um, that I'm a painter using these little materials. So I wanted to do a, a salon, kind of, re, kind of make an installation out of what a painting show is. So I started thinking about salons and making all these drawings and thought, well, why not just, why not do the president's? These are these icons. What's going to happen when I take something that's um, already over-celebrated, a subject that's so celebrated, and use these funny little materials on them? They're sort of um, foppy, um, kind of feminine, aren't they? Shh. So <laughs> here's <laughs> John Adams. Um, well, you know, the cool thing that I got really into was that, um, you, you know, using these materials, it's like men with curly hair look the best, I have to say. And you're going to agree because I'm going to, a little history here. Thomas Jefferson. Now, I didn't go, I didn't include every single president tonight because I did all 42. And, um, you know, I didn't want to, like, drive you crazy. But doesn't he look, that's James Madison. Isn't he just such a babe? <laughs> oh, my God. No, no, really. Because I'm, I'm jumping right ahead um, because uh, I didn't want to just totally drive you nuts. But here we are, Janet or rather, um, Andrew Jackson. And the thing was about, about this is that I'm not really political, but um, I started to do this reading in you know, the making of these um, portraits, and I wanted to do something about the backgrounds and, and sort of evoke something about every president. Well, I did really interesting reading from the really serious and scholarly to sort of like the silly, and um, I read that Andrew Jackson had a drooling problem. And I don't know if you knew that, but um, he did, and it supposedly he smelled. He had a bullet wound, like a festering bullet wound that never healed because of something. Yeah, you're wondering what I read, but it was really interesting reading. And so I wanted to make his background really sort of, um, you know, about kind of sickness. And I don't know, you probably can't read into that, but you know, when you're doing it bead by bead, it's very subtle. I mean, my whole point of using these materials is that I'm always trying to to be you know, understatement, irony. I don't want to bash you over the head with, you know, my political views. I, I, I'm not trying to be a politician. I'm just trying to kind of say it as it is and, and really sort of poke fun in a certain way. And I think that the meaning comes when you start to look at the amount of work in it. You have to take it seriously. So here's Martin Van Buren, who they called Martin Van Ruin at the time. And he was supposedly just really a dandy, considered just completely hot. And um, it's <laughs> that's not really very good. But he actually invented the whole idea of speeches, rallies, and sing-alongs. He changed the face of politics in the way that he campaigned. So thanks to Martin. Um, and also, he wasn't really a, um, he didn't come from humble beginnings like a lot of the presidents did. He was more, you know, he knew what sauces go on what and everything. But he got away with it and became president because that killing Indians was just as good as coming from humble beginnings, apparently. So he was able to come off as sort of um, um, down to earth. And you know, as I was reading all this stuff, I, I did kind of get a little cynical. <laughs> well, there's Harrison, who was only president for one month, because he, um, during his um, inaugural speech, he refused to put a coat on. And he got a really, really sick and died like a month later. And look at his, I look at him, poor fella. So anyway, John Tyler, the next feller, he was said that he was playing marbles when they rode up on the horse to tell him that he was now president. So his background has these little marbles. And he was hated. He was really hated. 
because he then started to assu- you know, like assert himself. And nobody wanted him to assert himself. They all wanted him to go back to playing marbles. So there's Millard Fillmore. And he made his own suits. So I thought I'd include him in here, because he's, he's sort of a dandy. Franklin Pierce. Now, he was considered just really a hunk. But they said about him that he never um, met a bottle he didn't like. And he was a mean drunk. One time he ran over an old lady on a horse. And when they found out, and he was drunk, drunk, drunk. And all these fell. A lot of these guys had drinking problems and smoked cigars and um, kind of like the gals. But um, he got away with running over this old lady. They said, oh, you know, it's, it's you, Mr. Pierce. That's OK. Um, so he was a hero of many a well-fought bottle. Well, here's Abe. Now, this was one president that I really, it was like, the, of all these that I'd re- read about so far and done portraits of, I really kind of got a, a little tear in the eye because um, he, he just seemed like such a hero, you know, just in terms of the things that he wrote. Um, somebody accused him of being two-faced, and he stopped and said, you know, well, madam, if I had two faces, do you think I'd choose this one? He's really wonderful, and, and so I really kind of was careful and loving about the way that his beard was done, just so, and his head is extra large, and he's got that big, strange ear. Um, but, um, you know, his education didn't add up to more than one year. I mean, he's really kind of interesting and historical, and also, he, this is the first president to sport facial hair. <laughs> oh, that's the most important thing to know. Uh, there you go, Miller. Well, this is Andrew Johnson. And um, he didn't, he wasn't really a big hero, was he now? But I kind of, you know, it's kind of hard because once you do this reading, and I really didn't know a lot about the presidents, um, once you do this reading, you, you can't help but um, get a little depressed. Um, but his, I made his pa- pattern kind of have a wallpaper look, but the truth is, is that he didn't do much for the cause and um, wasn't really very well loved. I mean, just historically, they say he's like one of the worst presidents ever. Um, because he didn't do anything to help um, black people or all that stuff. But it's really funny because um, none of the presidents did anything to help women, really. And um, that's okay. Um, Ulysses Grant. Now, Ulysses Grant, right about this time, I really did get into this whole like male culture thing about um, men and drinking and cigars and women. And Ulysses Grant, in particular, loved cigars. And he was. they say that he spent all his time conjugating the verb to receive. And because he won so many cigars during the spoils of war, so his background has these little cigars happening. And I got involved in making like cigar box sculptures just because I thought that that, you know, beading cigars, it's just this irony of beads when it comes to cigars and male culture. I think it's really fun, really funny. And there's Rutherford Hayes, and he really kind of inspired the whole thing because there's no portrait of him in the National Portrait Gallery. Gee, I wonder why. Garfield, who was, um, I mean, I'm just telling you all this fun stuff that I know about, because, you know, it's not really very scholarly, but it's just fun, juicy tidbits um, for you. But um, he was shot in the back by somebody who wanted to be the American consul or something in, in Paris, and he wouldn't give him the job, so he got shot in the back and had this terrible bullet wound, and um, Alexander Graham Bell, they all went digging around to try and get it out, and was digging, and Alexander Graham Bell had this thing, this device to try and help him get it out. It was just beep, beep, beep. They thought that it would they'd find the metal, find the bullet, and remove it. Well, they just kept pulling them apart, ripping them apart, so he died, and he wouldn't have if they'd let it be. So there's little itty-bitty bullets in the background there. <laughs> Didn't know you were going to get a little history, did you? It's Chester Arthur. He was another one. He was considered completely a hunk. So times hey, are a-changing. <laughs> this Teddy. What can we say about Teddy? Just kind of cute. Woodrow. The other thing about these portraits is that first I paint them underneath, so I get really involved in the idea that the, the silver beads kind of, um, the, they reflect through to the back of the painting, so it kind of takes on this modeling. And I wanted them to be black and white because I wanted them to seem like um, engravings. Warren Harding, <laughs> look at him. My goodness. So it's about the worst administration in U.S. history. Now, I reached a white man crisis. I'm sorry. I got really funky and depressed right about now. It's just sort of like the more that I read about these fellas, and they're all hanging in my wall in the studio just staring at me. And um, I was preparing all this for a show um, in Detroit at the Center for Creative Studies, and then um, I finished them up for Mark Quint, um, Mark Quint Gallery in San Diego here. Um, but 
At this moment in time, I was just plain depressed. Calvin Coolidge, silent Cal. You know, he was the only president that saved any money from his salary. Did you know that? And there's this little um, grid thing, kind of like a checker pattern. So it really kind of, you know, at first glance at these pieces, um, you just kind of get this, these portraits. But my whole sort of philosophy is that you have to spend time with this work because it takes so much time to do. And I want there to be all these little secrets in the work. Like in the kitchen, the more time that you spend and that you go, oh my gosh, there's a piece of dust, a little beaded piece of dust by the side of the refrigerator. So it's always to try and have all these little surprises that if you spend the time, the work will reward you for it, sort of a reward for looking. Um, and even in the kitchen, I did this funny little thing where I had these nude babes plastered underneath the, the tablecloth from like magazines and stuff. It's just sort of about if you're going to spend the time to look at the work, you get a little prize. <laughs> and in the kitchens, um, the case of the kitchen, that was a, was her, uh, you know, Hoover. Doesn't he look like a pit bull? Roosevelt. Truman. Now eyeglasses become really the thing. But don't you miss the curl now at this point? I mean, really? Are you kidding me? So it kind of becomes depressing, right, in the 20th century because we know these fellows. Kennedy looks like, you know, Elvis. I love that hair. It's just sort of something. And I kind of made him have a halo. His, his background is just, ah. Oh. Goodness. I mean, what can I say? Where is the curl? What happened to the curl? How far we've come at this point? These fellows just get so unattractive. Um, Nixon, and I know that sounds lowbrow, but you know I can't help it. This too, this was a big long process dealing with these guys. Nixon, what can we say about Nixon? I mean, I, I kind of had the little shoulder though. You see that little shoulder? He's got a big head and a little itty bitty shoulder. Ah, <laughs> uh, these guys. You know, it does get harder right now because. Um, they're, you know, now you know who they are. So this becomes a little bit of a challenge. The most difficult president to do was Carter. <laughs> and I did his face like twice. I actually did a whole portrait of his head and had to pick the whole thing off. Because in our minds, we see that big smile. The reality of his smile is that it's, it's really, you know, like it's, it's aqua fresh, you know, it's just a smile, a little smile. But we were so accustomed to seeing these political cartoons of that big cheesy smile, so I had to beat it that way. It's the only way it looked like him. It was kind of funny. That was really frustrating. Well, Reagan had to be have a big head. And <laughs> part of the, you know, he's part Elvis, you know, he's part you know, isn't he? And I mean I know it's a stretch, because he's kinda old, but the whole thing, I wanted him really big because I think he's really symbolic to um, the art world. He's sort of like this um, dollar bill to the art world, you know, during his time in the 80s of what was going on with how much things were selling for, and he just symbolizes so many things. So to me, he's a really important um, portrait. That little, itty bitty shoulder. Bush has even smaller shoulders. <laughs> so... <laughs> It's funny to see him so big. And there's Clinton. He looks kind of swarthy. Now, okay, at least he has a little bit of hair to deal with. So, like, of the, of the two candidates, I have to say that um, Clinton probably has the better hair. <laughs> and that's all I have to say about that. Um, so that kind of brings me to this, whole, you know, like, how I got carpal tunnel and how to avoid... Um, and that brings me to the next thing, which was that, um, and, and this was this show I, I kind of like hauled, hauled off and finished, did this project, because um, Mark Quint showed this um, just recently, um, just in time for the Republican convention, but um, we don't know if any, any, like, any of those people really came or not to the show. I mean, the whole point wasn't about being a timely. The show was about um, you know, being a painter. And I, I just realized, sort of in the doing of it, oh, wow, this is a good time to be doing portraits of the president. There's an awful lot to, you know, of research I can do. It's all readily available. So um, that's kind of nifty and neat that it's timely. But on a more important scale, it's really about 
saying that these materials are paint. And hopefully at this point, when you see these put together, you don't see beads anymore. You know, it's just, it's just, um, it's something else. I mean, it has to transcend the material. Um, isn't that a great slide? <laughs> um, okay, so this is the next project. This is what I'm in the throes of right now. What we are in the throes of right now. This is the backyard, and this is the clay model that um, I did this about, I don't know, eight months ago, nine months ago. Um, and um, basically the next project is a backyard, and it's about dealing with nature. And it's really funny because um, I was saying that I was criticized for, for using um, the kitchen, the imagery of women's work, and oh gee, it's about women, we want to avoid that quickly. Um, and doing a backyard um, is also is, a, is another kind of interesting um, thing because um, the whole concept of the fact that, um, that we're destroying nature. So um, it's sort of about destroying mother nature. It's, it's all kind of intertwined. It's about this whole thing about destruction and, and here I am kind of trying to create a paradise. I really like this um, this this quote that I I, um, I found that was about um, painting or about, it was about kind of like it was this painter in the 19th century who was talking about how how at some point um, nature is going to become um, people are going to think it's just an imagination of poets who are unhappy with 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 what is because we're not going to have nature anymore at all. So I don't know. I mean, it's kind of extreme, but the whole concept of suburbia is. Um, is about no death. I mean, in suburbia, everything is like green, 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 green grass, and um, how to make your grass green and how to make your roses really um, big. So um, <laughs> here we have it, permanent um, nature. And this project is really um, exciting. It's exciting to be here talking about it because um, I made the kitchen um, basically in most of my work um, alone. And um, now I have this wonderful group of people that are here from Mesa, and um, a lot of them are here tonight, so this is really, really, really great. And um, what we're doing is we need a million blades of grass. So um, each one of these, this, is, this model is made out of clay. And um, I wanted to do, you know, when you do a model, you have to kind of evoke the labor of what you're trying to do. So every single piece of grass is like made out of clay because every, what we're doing is we're making, um, we're taking pins, basically, and, and putting beads on them. And um, there are about seven beads per pin, and we figured out that there are um, that it takes about two hours to do a hundred. And um, it's been this really incredible process. You know, there's this Balinese saying that we have no art; we try to do everything well. And that's really the philosophy of this work: is that we 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 try to do everything well. That every single thing has meaning, and that sometimes, in order to find beauty, even in the suburbs. Um, you have to look at it by the by the with a microscope. And if you were to go into um, a backyard and, and just really check out the grass, which everybody who works with me now, it's like every time we see grass, it's like whoa, because um, you know, or even even concrete. And I think that's kind of the the goal of art is that you you subvert the way that you ever see anything again, so that when you go home tonight and you see your kitchen, you might visualize it with beads. Well, that's that's the ultimate to me, is that is that maybe that it makes you begin to look at life in a different way. Um, so this is the, it's going to be a rose garden all the way around the whole piece and then a clothes line. And then it's going to be a, a, um, a sprinkler that sprays out beads and it, it beads, I can't even say, it sprays out beads. And um, it's opening at the Santa Monica Museum this coming June. So we're really moving right along. In fact, I should be working right now. Somebody um, from the group suggested that we hand out um, beads and wires so all you guys could like get something done. Don't just sit there, do something help us. And this is the process. These are, this is the making of the, um, the picnic table that you saw in the model. And um, these are, those are Noriko's fingernails. It's so great for me. I have to say that having other hands and other hearts and minds on this has been the greatest, greatest possible thing on the planet. It's been, you know, challenging and all that stuff, but really wonderful. There's something about collective goodwill, about people coming together. I mean, you know, Things are really ugly in the world. There's all this ugly stuff, and the fact that a bunch of us could get together and bead a backyard and make nature literally plant beauty is, to me, um, astounding. With no money, either. Um, there we are, working away. There's Brandy. 
Brandy's the grass goddess, making grass. So you can kind of see in the lower right there, those are like little wads. She's amazing. She just like piles up the grass. At the end of the day, there's this huge, you can't see her, there's this grass. Um, and that's the table. There's um, someone else's hands. This is Melissa's hands making grass. It's so great. So every single blade of grass gets set into these boxes um, that are two feet by two feet, and we set them in. So it's literally, it's not fake grass. It's not like I cheat at all. It's literally dense, like jeweled nature. So every single blade is the, is the thickness. You know, it's a piece of wire. Um, so when you add them all together, like a million of them, it's, it's pretty astounding. I don't have any slides of that, pro of that so far, but it's, it's, it's coming along. It's pretty neat. This is the table, the picnic table with the leaves. Um, this is just really, to me, it's just an extension of the kitchen. It's a, again like beating the suburbs. Um, and everything, again, it's about everything counts. Every single piece within the, the piece is like really crucial. From the um, pieces inside the salad to the poured beer, the olive on the sandwich. Everything is cared for. So what happens when you care for everything and you multiply that by 600 square feet? That's the challenge as an artist, and I think that's what makes good art, and that's what I, um, that's my goal, anyway, to try to, obviously, make, try to make good art, but to me, the goal is to, what happens if you have that kind of intensity and passion by every little thing, like even the blade of grass, even the little fork there has meaning, and you multiply that. So here's the sandwich, close up, this is the salad bowl, that's the close up of the salad bowl. So everything inside the salad, it's first it's sculpted and then you know all the, the cereal piece or the pieces of salad rather and it goes all the way to the bottom of the bowl and the bottom of the bowl is beaded i don't think i'm going to do that with every single thing in this piece <laughs> I, I don't think it'll get done but um the whole philosophy of having having everything um cared for and attended to is really the philosophy of the work and those are those those roses so that is um that is the work um, and um, so it's sort of a long way from soup cans and um, stuff, but this is the next piece, and that's all that I have to say. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask them. I wonder if we're going to like turn lights on so I can see if anyone has questions. I feel really underappreciated actually, so I think I should get like, you know, cheese loafs and Christmas time, you know? <laughs> I, should get, like, I should get like little logs, you know? What's with that? Yeah, I saw another hand somewhere back somewhere. Yeah. Well, that's a really great question. Um, 
because over the years, you know, you when you're moving and all the things that have happened, um, you know, I didn't really, I would sort of cover things and sort of do 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 do. Let's put this here, and there'll be leaks in my studio, and I just. Um, but the thing that was really a turning point for me in terms of maintenance was when um, the piece traveled first to the New Museum in New York, and then it went to the Minneapolis Institute. The Minneapolis Institute of Arts is a huge encyclopedic museum that has, you know, like ancient Egyptian things. They had to like move that Picasso out of the way to make room for the. I mean, they're a major, major um, institution that has a conservation department in them. And the way that they treated the kitchen was that they they moved things, you know, with gloves, and there were like six people moving things, like. One person lifted the curtain, another person stood behind them with their hand like this, another person behind them like, you know, I mean, it was like completely, I mean, we took 10, it was 10 people in the kitchen doing this. And when it came time, the piece ended up extending. The show was supposed to close, I think in July, and they ended up keeping it on because um, there was a demand for it. And so we had to clean it. It was sort of like, oh gosh, it's getting really dusty because it was in this sort of atrium, not atrium, but you know, the, there was all these floors that are about I think it was like four floors up. So you could go to the fourth floor of the whole museum and look down on the kitchen. So imagine all that dust, like floating into the kitchen, people coughing and all that total filth. Totally. I shouldn't even be thinking about this. Oh. So um, anyway, we went in there with little vacuum cleaners. Yeah, but you can't vacuum. That's right, because if you do vacuum over time, like tapestries, they were telling me that they used to use vacuums on tapestries, and eventually it pulls up the thread. So what we did was take little sable brushes dust it, and then use the vacuum cleaner to suck up the dust. But I have to tell you, it was really, really beautiful and amazing to see um, you work being handled on that level. It's going to be a challenge, but if it goes to institutions, it'll be cared for. The hardest thing is if I have to care for it, because I, um, I don't have those resources. So it is a challenge. Just building it, just the labor part. That was over time, you know, that was piece by piece, and I had help with that. Some of the stuff, you know, like um, things that are sculptures, you know, I don't estimate how much time it takes to make a, to sculpt a tablecloth out of paper mache or whatever. But I had help with the building of those walls, some really terrific humans. So I don't know, you know, I think that's the least amount of time, to tell you the truth, slamming together some ply. And oh, the whole piece took five years, yeah. Would you like to come to my studio and work <laughs> and find out? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I have this like really strange instinct now when people ask those questions, like, come to my studio, you could make grass. I have this really great way I could now show you. Um, yeah, everything's built out of, you know, everything's really solid out of wood. Yeah, actually, when I lived in LA, somebody threw away a stove and I said, oh, I'll take that. So, um, you know, but other than that, everything's a sculpture. I see a hand back. Downtown San Diego. How do I get it? Oh, gosh. You talk to Brandy over there who's raising her hand. Brandy, go, go like two hands. <laughs> she, will, she will set you up. She's the, yeah. I love you. That is the question we wanted to hear all night. <laughs> um, you talk to Brandy, who's like right behind you. And um, <laughs> and that's what we're doing. And that's how it's, you know, it's really funny because um, I didn't talk at all about how this stuff is done. Because it's, to me, it's so, it's done in such a, it's the technique of the doing is, is, is to me the most boring thing. It's, I mean, so, it's so simple. It's what's behind it. And we're always talking about that um, in the studio, you know, sort of like we're sitting there, we all, we're all in the doing of it, but we're, you, you know, you have to sort of be occupied on all these other things in your mind. So, you know, putting a bead on a wire is not really the most um, difficult thing. Yeah. What kind of grades did you get in school? 
Yeah, all my life. Yeah, definitely. I didn't necessarily always get good grades though, because I didn't I didn't do well with criticism. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I always I always knew I was going to be an artist. I just didn't really like, you know, when you sort of do that and you sign up for classes, and all of a sudden people don't like what you're doing. So um, my. <laughs> And you know, as an artist, nobody teaches you that, that you have to get to the point of being able to go past that criticism. And we were talking about this um, today, that um, you know, like a, an instructor will tell you, an instructor will t maybe steer you off course and really discourage you. So you have to learn how to be a student. It's really important um, to learn how to, how to learn, to be able to go past all the teacher stuff, get what you need to get, but be able to, um, to sift through criticism or discouragement that you might get too. And, and feed off the encouragement, because it's a privilege to get an education. No, not yet. Maybe it will. Um, there's that whole thing about conservation that has a lot to do with that, though. So hopefully the work will get treated in such a way um, that a lot of that stuff won't happen, you know. Yeah, the way that that works is replaces it for me. No, nobody touches it, but. Um, there's a person at the museum that's a registrar who um, basically does a condition report when the work gets off the docks. And they look at everything, they examine everything, and then I get this phone call from hell. You know, why is it there's two beads missing on the lower left corner? Would you want us to fix that? No. Don't touch it. I mean, you know, so there, are, there is this kind of thing because beads definitely, you know, they're not like this. Um, every once in a while there's going to be a little bead casualty. But, um, you know, it's not, you know, like hugely, hugely, it is a very big challenge to pack the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, oh my gosh, I'm just going to start to laugh. Um, n yeah, I did. And in fact, I've used a lot of, um, you know, we have this glue thing. We glue things in my studio. We use a lot of glue. And um, there's a particular glue that I really like. It's a really heavy craft glue. It's white glue. It's not Elmer's glue. It's just a heavy-duty craft glue. And I've tried a lot of glues over the years. And that was part of, you know, the first part of the slide when I was showing early work. I spent two years before I was really making the structure of the kitchen, before I started building stuff, before I got to the stove and all that stuff, in experimenting with glues and, and um, resin. I experimented with resins, with um, epoxies. With so now when people are, when we're working together, things are really smooth because you know, kind of worked that out, but there was definitely a period of, of experimenting a lot, and I still do that. I mean, even like the making of the roses, um, I made a lot of different ways of making roses. So you always have to make like five things before you get that one thing that's right. Um, you know, it's a lot of experiment. Or like the way that we're making the grass with wire, well, like about five years ago I started, I was making things with, you know, putting beads on wire. So it's always, it really, you know, nothing just comes out. My life is not about anything that happens um, spontaneously at all. I mean, everything is painstaking. Because you're right, you know, some glues just won't work. So, I saw a hand somewhere in my peripheral vision, or maybe somebody was yawning. I don't know what that was. I saw this movement. <laughs> um, well, you know, I have to say that, um, I, don't, I haven't been to the doctor, but yeah, then it's definitely an issue. You know, people always say, you're going to go blind doing that, and you're going to lose your hearing, and, you know, I mean, I don't know how artists in the past, you know, like, you know I don't want to think that, that it's anything unusual, like, for anyone who uses their hands a lot to experience fatigue, you know, like pianists and all that stuff, so I don't know what the solution is. I mean, how did artists 100 years ago deal with pain in their hands? Did they quit, you know? I mean, Michelangelo kept making stuff. So, I don't know if it has to be debilitating or not, the fact that you're in pain. I think it's just maybe the second chapter, like, oh, now I work and I'm in pain when I work. So, I don't, you know, I don't know. I keep thinking about, like, a second career, and um, it's really hard when other people, it's, you know, it's, it's about handing it over at this point. Like, um, 
the table that I showed you, I physically can't work the way it's required that you work. You have to work, you know, straight up and down. So um, I have really wonderful, terrific humans who are a part of my life now, and and it's 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 really kind of a strange process of letting go because a lot of times, you know, early on making the work, I don't know if I can this is a whole long story, but early on making the work, people used to always say, you know, why don't you get people to do your work for you? Like they completely didn't realize that this is paint and this is art. You know, other people can just do this, and that's not the fact at all. I mean, it's, it's, it took years to even develop my hands and then to be able to train people to do this stuff. So um, the people who work with me are all artists themselves, and they have a vision. So it's not about, like, just having slaves. And so to hand over that work, it's, it's, it's really like handing over a piece of um, your heart in a lot of ways. Because the doing of the work, you come to these epiphanies, you know, like making the table that was in the kitchen. The doing of that, you, you, all the thoughts that you go through and all those things, um, it's really beautiful, and so now um, Noriko, who did the the side of the um, the whole picnic table, who knows what she was thinking? <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, now it's hers too, and now it's Brandy's, and now it's um, you know you know everyone who's here, and Melissa. Now it's everyone else's. So now the work, you know, now it's it's Scott's, now it's Mark's, now it's it's it's, it's not just my my work anymore, and that's something really beautiful. So if Carpal Tunnel is part of doing that, then I'm glad, because I'm such a control freak that probably I wouldn't have had people come in. If I could physically do it myself, I would, because I can be really um, small-minded that way, you know? And there's something really in incredible about having a lot of people on something. So that's my long story. I think I'm done. Is everyone just tired of hearing me talk? I'm just like, my voice is starting to get, I can't listen to myself anymore. Well, you know, like, come and work with me. Um, no, um, well, making grass is absolutely critical for any art student, I think. <laughs> um, no, uh, to, to really, okay, this is like the deep thought for the day. Um, you know, art making is like, it's that burning tip of awareness. It's, um, making art is about finding that, that burning tip and staying there, sustaining it and not letting anything steer you off course. Discouragement, lack of money, all that stuff, to try to, to, to hold that within, you know, it's like a maintenance of, of what's sacred to you. Because um, I really believe that um, there has to, there's no like lesson you can really take to believe in yourself. But, um, well, if you make grass now, see, you know, <laughs> but um, it's about kind of going to the center and knowing the whole. So, does that sound like advice, or does that just sound totally weird and new age? I told you I needed to stop talking. Okay, I'm done. Bye-bye.